So welcome all of you. Welcome uh, Dr. Gauri Parimu Krishnan ma'am. It's a great honor and great pleasure to have you here today. And uh, a very warm welcome to all of you on this occasion of Professor M. A. Dhaki annual memorial lecture. This is the third one. And I'm very glad that every year the response has been increasing. People have been very happy about it. And so are we. Uh, for those who do not know Sambhasha, uh, I'm Chetana Gosavi. Sambhasha Foundation is uh, a new, comparatively new venture. We are into cultural studies and languages as our focus. So all aspects of culture. And uh, we try to look at all aspects of culture from non-political, non-religious, and totally unbiased perspective with the help of scientific and archaeological and historical research tools. So uh, please do visit our website to know more about us. I, I won't take much of your time talking about Sambhasha here. Uh, coming to Professor M. A. Dhaki, I think all of you who are here definitely know him and that is why you are here. He was, uh, I should say, a greatest historian of his times who has given a very different perspective uh, to the entire art history uh, in, I mean, perspective to art history and the study of art history in India. And uh, in the very first lecture when Professor Parul Pandyadhar had uh, talked about Professor uh, Ahmed Haki, we all know he was a multifaceted personality, a multi-talented person, and a very nice human being. So um, fortunately, so far, all the three speakers for this lecture have been people who were who have had direct interaction with Professor Ahmed Haki. And they know him as a person, they know him as their guru, their mentor, and of course, as a greatest art historian of his times. So without taking much of your time on introductory uh, part, I will hand it over to my colleague Sanyukta uh, to introduce and welcome our today's esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Gauri, Krishnan Parim, uh, Gauri Parimo Krishnan. Welcome, ma'am, once again. And over to you, Sanyukta. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome this year's guest speaker, Dr. Gauri Parimukrishnan. Uh, Dr. Gauri Parimukrishnan has dedicated 30 years to Singapore and India's arts and heritage sector. Uh, she has curated major international exhibitions of Indian and Asian art for the past 28 years. She served the Pradhan Mantri Sangrahale in New Delhi as its chief curator and is currently working on curatorial projects for the Ministry of Culture as an independent curator. Her major contribution as the founding senior curator and center director is the development of the Indian Heritage Center and the South Asia Galleries of Asian Civilizations Museum, museum from inception to fusion. Uh, Dr. Krishnan taught Indian, history, Indian art history at the National University of Singapore and Museum Studies and Curatorship at the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Dr. Krishnan is the recipient of the uh, Commendation Medal uh, and Public Administration Medal Bronze for her contribution to the arts and heritage sector in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Krishnan's extensive publication and research interests span the interrelationship of the arts of India and Southeast Asia, temple architecture and sculpture, and community heritage. Uh, her major publications include Naina Dalal, Contemporary Indian, Indian Printmaker, the Power of the Female, Devangana Sculptures on the Indian Temple Architecture, Ramayana in Focus, Visual and Performing Arts of Asia, The Divine Within, Art and Living Culture of India and South Asia, Nalanda Sri Vijaya and Beyond, Re-Exploring Buddhist Art in Asia, Ratna Deepa, New Dimensions in Indian Art History and Theory, Essay in the Honor of Professor Ratan Parimu, among others. Uh, Dr. Krishnan, we all are pleased to have you here, and we all are looking forward to your lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, I guess you are, uh, your mic is off. Namaskar, and thank you very much, Samyukta, for that very kind introduction. Um, I would like to um, thank Sambhasha for actually starting this uh, memorial lecture series. 
in honor of Professor Emid Haki, uh, who uh, is not a typical scholar. He cannot be defined in a framework, a typical framework of a scholar. Uh, he was more than a scholar. He was multifaceted, as uh, Chetana Ji rightly uh, pointed out. Uh, and uh, his impact on many of uh, uh, the students like myself who studied under him directly and also through his books and publications, not only on temple architecture and sculpture, but also Jain um, philosophy uh, is, is uh, so widespread and so uh, deeply, uh, deeply imprinted uh, on their, um, not only on their minds, on their professional training, but also in what they do. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the, uh, my, my lecture uh, today will uh, start by my offering homage, uh, respects to um, my guru. Uh, but the definition of guru in this case is very unique. Um, I went to um, study uh, uh, soon after my uh, completing my my master's degree in 1987 at Baroda at uh, the Faculty of Fine Arts Department of Art History. I had just started my PhD research, uh, which was on Gujarat and Ra Gujarat Rajasthan sculptures of the Apsaras and Devanganas, um, which was part of my my thesis for my uh, for my dance um, research and my interest was very much on the nritya hastas uh, and with this very limited knowledge and uh, scope i had actually gone to um, as all the students of art history would go to uh, banaras to the ramnagar um, center for art and archaeology uh, archive of the american institute of indian studies and that's when i first met uh, dhaki sahab um, in 87, in the summer, and I kept going 88, 89, uh, 90. And every summer, I would go there and I would uh, research into the material in every visit. In fact, every tea break, every day, uh, with uh, Dhaki Saab uh, talking to us uh, uh, in just simple conversation. And he would throw these ideas. He would just say, look at this book. He would say, look at that reference. And it will lead me into an ocean. And it will just open up vistas you know, in my understanding and perception of my topic. And I owe it completely to my research at the American uh, Institute Archive and the guidance, uh, the non-formal education, I would say, that was given to me by Daki Saab in uh, my research at a very pivotal point in my research um, period uh, that really opened up my understanding and vision. And I owe my book, the entire, which is actually uh, the publication, uh, Power of the Female, um, Indian Temple, uh, Devangana Sculptures on Indian Temple Architecture, the topic of today's presentation. Can we have the next slide, please? Is based on my PhD thesis. Um, uh, which I owe uh, completely to the guidance among many others, uh, but at the formative stage uh, to the guidance given by Dhati Sahib. Um, so my focus then increased or widened to uh, include Gujarat, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. Uh, please stop uh, moving the slides till I say. Yeah, we just stay on this slide. Uh, and this, um, uh, the whole exploration of uh, my research geographically uh, encompassed um, not only Gujarat and Rajasthan, but also Madhya Pradesh. Um, so this is uh, the, the cover of the book. And for those of you who are interested uh, at the end of this lecture or generally interested in the study of Indian uh, sculpture, um, the book is available at DK Print World, and this was launched in 2013. And the point I want to make here is that it took me this long to publish the book uh, because I was too busy organizing museums for which I was um, uh, working full time in Singapore. Uh, but it also gave me certain maturity, certain understanding and certain distance from my, my initial PhD research. Uh, to revise it and to include uh, many aspects of interpretation of the Devangana motif on Indian temple architecture, uh, going beyond just text and sculpture correlation 
uh, to include uh, different perspectives of interpretation or methodologies of interpretation, such as semiotics, uh, psychoanalysis, as well as feminism. So um, I'm very pleased that the book actually was, uh, I was able to revise this book, and this was launched in 2013. Next slide, please. Moving into the um, core of the uh, topic of today's uh, presentation, I would like to read a few passages from my book uh, and also to uh, locate the material that is uh, being um, being discussed today. Uh, this is a map of which, uh, map of India from 800 to 1200. Uh, the focus of our uh, uh, our discussion today will be mostly on Western India, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh. Um, the geopolitical areas under discussion here are. Uh, traditionally addressed as Maru Gurjara, Maru Gurjara, Dahala, Dakshina Koshala, Gopagiri, Malava, Arbuda, and so on. The architecture that developed in these areas falls under the greater category of Nagara, but when minutely observed, each area has its own localized style, scale, and motif type. Each, each region osmotically merged with the adjoining due to the exchange of goods, ideas, and people. Morphologically speaking, M. A. Dhaki was able to give his insight into the unique as well as common features shared by these regions, which gave birth to a new amalgamated style in the late 10th century, which he coined Maru Gurjara. This particular research has lent a new approach and dimension to the study of architectural morphologies and structure based on lines of biological species and the study thereof. Which is even more significant. What is even more significant is the use of Sanskrit terminology and its introduction in describing the various parts of the temple, their typologies, and their variations. The present study also takes into consideration the nomenclatures, stylistic groupings, cross currents of influences, and sharing of common motifs, as proposed by Dhaki, Michael Meister, and Krishna Deva. Rightly observed by Dhaki, and I quote. The style of Madhya Desha, of contemporary Dasharana Malava, Chedi Desha, of the Maru Medapata and Shakambhari complex, and of the Himalayan kingdoms represented variants of one and the same style, which evolved in the pre medieval period, uh, specifically during the Pratihara age, from the earlier homogeneous style that prevailed in the Ganga Yamuna Valley as well as in central India during the time of the Guptas. Uh, quote complete. Krishna Deva has called the art and architecture of pre and early medieval times in central India and upper and eastern India an extension of Gupta art. But elsewhere, uh, Krishna Deva also mentions the common features and regional variations and local idioms shared by the temples of the Pratihara period in central India and Rajasthan. My architectural concern neither pertains to the originality of the Pratihara style nor to the motifs developed by the localized guilds, but to the furtherance of the style itself, to its evolution, and specifically to the development of the Mandovara. I will come to this immediately after completing this paragraph. In order to do this, the Mandovara of the Pratihara temple comes into focus since our period of study starts with the beginning of the Pratihara age, and it has been most widely influential style. Krishna Deva identifies the Pratihara style of central India as akin to that of Rajasthan, but its roots lie deeper in the soil of central India itself, with antecedents for a period of for a number of decorative motifs in the earlier tem temples of the Gupta period of the area, which is echoed by Dhaki in his study on the Vitanas. This point remains undisputed. Temples at Amrol. 8th century and Nareshar, late 8th century, were contrast were constructed by the imperial Pratiharas after the shift from Marumandal to Kanauj. The 9th century CE saw the rise of Jain temples at Devgarh and at the Bado Shiva temple Indore, Chaturmukh Mahadev temple Nachna Putra, uh, Jarai Mata temple Barwa Sagar, the Sun temple Mankheda, Telika Mandir Gwalior, the Gadarmal Temple Bado, Shiv Temple Terahi, the Mala Devi Temple Gyaraspur, and Ghateshwar Mahadev Temple Badoli. 
the 8th and 9th century temples of the Pratihar age in the Rajasthan area of Oshyan, Harihar group, the Kalika Mata temple Chittorgarh and Kumbhashyam temple Chittorgarh are the twin temples of Shiva and Vishnu at Buchkala were built by the Pratihara king Nagabhatta II in 815 CE. The Kameshwar temple at Awa and old temple at Lamba also fall into the early phase of this architecture. These are some of the early um, uh, articles of uh, Sri M. A. Dhaki, which are very important. The pre-Solanki period architecture prevailing in Gujarat was of the Saurashtra style patronized during the Maitraka and Saindava rule, resembling the Kalika temple, Mata temple at Chitorgarh and generally relating to the architecture of the Pratihara age are the Sun Temple at Sutrapada, the Roda group of temples, and the Sun Temple at Bhimnath near Prabhaspatan. The commencing of the 10th century brought about further development in temple architecture, not only in terms of structural complexity and expansion, but also in intricacy of design, sculptural imagery, and form. At the close of the 10th century, the styles of Maru and Gurjar were swept off their heels and they lost their individual provincial features, giving birth to a new style, which, which is termed by Dhaki as Maru Gurjara. This confluence turned out to be a passionate embrace of styles, one exemplified by a masculine strength and structural monolithic firmness, the Gurjara, and the other epitomized by grace, decorative beauty, and delicacy of treatment, the Maru. This style, was this style was patronized later by the Solanki kings of Gujarat and it spread uh, and it spread its influence to Maharashtra, Malwa and the Chedi country. The Maha Maru and the Maha Gurjara are two distinct regional schools with their own sub-regional stylistic variations. The following sites indicated in the development process observed in the architecture of the, these two major regional styles by Dhaki uh, are, have been conformed to by me in my present study in the placement of the Devangana sculptures on the Mandovara of the various temples. Um, with this introduction, I would like to now take you into the presentation itself. There are two parts to this presentation. One is the um, architectural development, as I highlighted right at the beginning. What happens on the Mandovara between 8th and the 12th 12th century, the wall of the temple, the vitana, the pillars is very important because that is the interest of my research. That's where the placement of the Devangana sculptures appears. And second is the interpretation of the motifs of all the Devangana sculptures. I have chosen a few examples for the purpose of this presentation, but there are more than 16 types of Devangana that I have identified across the 400 years in Western India. And by extension, this motif also can be seen in the sculptures of other parts of India as well, which um, brings me to the point about uh, the oral traditions which may have traveled between the regions through uh, patronage, through mathas, uh, through art, uh, architectural or sthapati guilds, and so on and so forth. So this is a very important uh, uh, material at hand, which I would now like to uh, illustrate and elucidate in the next few minutes. Next slide, please. So we start with Gujarat. We have an example from uh, North Gujarat, Himmat Nagar district. This is a site called Roda, uh, 8th century, uh, which has um, a simple uh, plan temple. Uh, just like the Gupta period temples, there is one um, Garbagriha uh, with a Shikhara which has fallen down and there is a Mukha Chatushki with four pillars. And you can see the Mandovara, the wall is very simple. Uh, however, on the uh, there is a plain wall. Uh, it has um, only one uh, Deva Koshta in the center, uh, whereas um, what is very unique and interesting is that there are capitals on the pillars, which has a representation of the Devangana sculptures. And this, in my view, um, I may be wrong, but from my study, this is the earliest representation of Devangana's on Gujarat temples. Um, it is not on the Mandovara, but on the pillars. Next, please. 
then another uh, typology which is very interesting is the maru style which is uh, again very evident at uh, um, at ocean this is the harihara temple number 1 uh, also of 8th century uh, which has subsidiary shrines you can see the um, <clears throat> the garbhagriha is uh, triratha uh, is a latina uh, shikara it has a mukha chatushki uh, and very long um, uh udumbara um, sorry udgama in front of the uh, above the uh, bhadra deva koshthas but the presence of the apsaras or the devanganas is on the karna deva koshthas of the subsidiary shrines which is a rare uh, phenomenon and this is where you find the uh, present representation of the devanganas emergent or emerging uh, in the uh, architecture of the pratiharas Uh, by the 10th century you see them firmly placed in the middle um right next to the bhadra deva koshta in the uh, flanking the bhadra deva koshta and very often in the uh, representation of sun temples you see very um uh, uh, obvious presence of the uh, devanganas right next to the bhadra deva koshta and the karna deva koshta is always occupied by the um, dikpalas next slide please <clears throat> Can we have the next slide? Yeah. So by the 10th century, you have uh, now. I'm I'm just showing some iconic temples. We can't go through uh, more than 100 temples. Uh, we have yet another uh, uh, iconic example of uh, the Jagat uh, Ambika Mata Temple from Udaipur uh, in Rajasthan, uh, dated 960 CE. where you have the bhadra deva koshtha the mahishasura mardini you have the vyalas in the salilantara then you have this uh, sort of mini uh, deva koshtha and then on the on the next salilantara you have the two apsaras and on the karna deva koshtha is the dikpalas and um, this is a very uh, developed phase of uh, we can also say maru gurjara style Uh, where you have a, be, besides other elements of the merging of the maha gurjar and the maru gurjar the presence of the uh, devanganas is very um, prominent and they have a secured location which has now uh, which will continue for the next um, several centuries uh, next slide please I have changed the slide. I don't know why it. Okay. Okay. Um, then we come to the uh, another uh, Maru Gurjar example from Ocean. This is Sachya Mata Temple, uh, again of eleventh uh, century, first quarter. And here again, you will see uh, the Badra Koshta is uh, ha has the presence of the main deity. I think it's a Vishnu. uh vishnu uh, image um yeah tri tri vikrama but you can see that in the next right next to the uh, bhadra deva koshta you have the presence of the two devanganas and on the karna deva koshtas the dikpalas and also you have the uh, details of the various other parts of the um, temple which are very crisp and very detailed in their carving Uh, and the richness of the maru gurjara style of embellishment as well as the structure of the temple is quite um, developed by this time next slide please uh, another uh, massively important example of the solanki patronage this is bhimdev the uh, second this is the building uh, of the uh, step well uh, built by the queen udayamati uh, which is again a very important uh, uh, reference in the context of the study of devanganas that uh, a, a, a structure associated with water uh, um, patronized by a queen and the presence of multifarious uh, imagery of uh, devanganas on each and every tier of the walls the two side retaining walls of the temple and in many many tiers so 
in terms of uh, the uh, presence of this material, you can uh, uh, this uh, imagery, you can see its efflorescence uh, in a very unprecedented manner at Rani Ki Wow. Um, this is something that uh, I, I, I will be elaborating when I discuss the uh, presence of uh, uh, iconography, I mean, uh, when I discuss the iconography of the various Devanganams in the second half of my talk. Now we move to uh, Madhya Pradesh, and this is a very important uh, example of, uh, again, uh, presence of Devanganas on the uh, area between the Mandapa and the uh, first um, Kakshasana, and between the first Kakshasana and the second Kakshasana of the uh, Shikara. So at every conjoint, you can see the presence of the Devanganas. This is something that is very uh, well developed even by the 10th century in uh, Khajuraho. And uh, according to Dhaki, this is uh, due to the influence from the Rajasthan uh, area, you know, moving into the Jijakabukti area. I mean, Mewar or uh, Maru area into the Jijakabukti area. Next slide, please. Uh, yet another example, again, of a very, very uh, uh, well-developed uh, structure. This is a Bhumija temple of Udayeshwar from Udayapur uh, of the 11th century. And here also you find uh, very well-developed uh, Ratha Pratiratha. And each one has the presence of the Devanganas carved on, uh, on them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we come to Gujarat now, and here is an example of the Sun Temple at Modhera. Uh, this is the tank in front of the Natamandapa. This is the Natamandapa, uh, and uh, behind, um, just on the left side of the Natamandapa is a main temple. I will be discussing the Devanganas placed on the main temple, but this is an example of a, a very richly decorated, richly carved, well-established Maru Gurjara style, according to Dhaki Sab. Uh, and you can also see the Devakulika, the small Devakulikas in the uh, Kund area also has very elaborate uh, Bhadra, um, Ratha Pratirathas and Karna Devakoshtas with the presence of Apsaras in them, uh, Devanganas in them. Next slide, please. Uh, we also find the presence of uh, uh, Devanganas on the ceiling, on the Vitanas, as identified by Dhaki Sahib. And I'm here showing you two examples, one from 10th century, where you can see uh, the, the iconography of uh, Madana or Kamadeva, uh, along with Vidyadharis. Uh, so in uh, uh, different uh, temples, uh, either it is uh, Vishnu temple, Shiva temple, Surya temple, Jain temple, uh, you always find uh, the presence of Devanganas. So the iconography is quite interchangeable and can be seen in different monuments of different times. Uh, but from the Maru Gurjara Vitana development, you can see their presence in the inner side of the, the ceilings also of the Mandapas. And this is yet another very interesting example. Again, very well developed, mature phase, Marugurchar phase uh, from the um, Natamandap at Kiradu. Uh, there's a Shiva temple, and this is a um, Natamandap, which is fairly damaged. But you can see the presence of the Devanganas on the lower part of the pillar. And each pillar has maybe four or six of them. And uh, this is another a good example of a. Um, <coughs> Maru Gurjara side. Next, please. Now, uh, with this background, I will um, come into the next uh, section of my uh, presentation. Uh, I know you, many of you have already asked this question. What is Apsara? What's a, <clears throat> how do you define Devangana? What's the relation between Apsara and Devangana? So the next few slides I will... Uh, take uh, to define the first actually the iconography of non uh, goddess or non mainstream goddess 
feminine imagery in Indian temple architecture with reference to Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh, for which I have to now see antecedents. And where do I see the antecedents? I see them in folk goddesses, in yakshis, in apsaras from literature, in the shared Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu architectural sculptures, and in oral and written traditions. Uh, as I said about uh, literature, uh, it can be Sanskrit literature, it can be uh, Prakrit literature, it can be temple architectural texts, uh, where I find the references to, um, uh, to draw the inspiration for the definition of the iconography of the Devanganas. So we see um, in a simple diagram that is right in front of you, we see the rise of independent goddesses who are um, uh, bestowing or who are celebrating uh, fertility and abundance. Then you have also uh, goddesses which are represented with weapons, such as the uh, uh, Proto Durga from um, Chandraketugar. Then you have Vedic goddesses like Brihadiva, Sinivali, Ila, representing. Uh, 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 maternal uh, aspects of uh, which contribute to the evolution of the concept of Sri Lakshmi and also uh, the development of uh, apsaras in uh, the various uh, Puranic uh, literature such as Urvashi, Rambha, Menaka and so on. And in the visual representation you find the feminine uh, uh, feminine uh, symbols such as the yakshis or the apsaras and the nadi devatas all the way from the early buddhist you can see all the way from uh, um, barhut sanchi uh, to uh, mathura sanghol and uh, many other sites uh, so can we move to the next slide so very uh, interesting references have come to light where they say that monument like a home without a woman monument uh, without the decoration of the apsaras or devanganas is incomplete so there is a possibility that there is this understanding of uh, decorating uh, the uh, apsaras and devanganas or yakshis on a monument had a very early uh, evolution in the development of indian uh, monuments religious monuments buddhist jain and hindu alike um, in different uh, because visually or stylist uh, or iconographically many of these uh, um, iconographies have continued uh, this is just an uh, an example elaborating on the idea of the pot the abundance uh, uh, which is symbolized by the purna ghatta and from the purna ghatta you have the lotus emerging you have the uh, feminine uh, body with the uh, lotus head and also the vulva exposed, which could have been part of some form of ritual worship or ritual practice. Uh, and the womb also symbolizing regenerative power, uh, representing the earth, the Sri, references to lotus in Sri Sukta, uh, along with um, uh, emer emergence of uh, Lakshmi from the wash, from the ocean, from the waters during the churning of the ocean and the references to aditi as uh, representing heaven air and as mother uh, has also been uh, the basis on which some of the early iconographies of the non mainstream uh, feminine iconography in early indian art is based next slide please Next slide, please. I have to change the slide. It's taking a little time to actually be visible. Give us a, let's give it a few seconds. I don't know why, but it's taking a little time. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, this is just uh, two examples. I was talking about the Pancha Chuda. Uh, the example on the right refers to the sort of uh, uh, what I define as the Veera or the 
the more um, brave aspect of the goddess, which could be the um, proto uh, Durga uh, imagery, whereas the imagery on the left is of uh, proto Lakshmi or the goddess of abundance uh, that we, we see in uh, early Indian art. Next slide, please. Uh, and I also look at the examples of woman and tree because tree is also associated with fertility. And we have examples going all the way back to Mesopotamia and Egypt. There's an example right here uh, of a vessel on in which you can see the, uh, the tree goddess uh, is uh, represented, is etched. And you have this ring stone from Murtaza Ganj where you have the alternative motif of uh, female and uh, woman and tree. Uh, this is also one of the earliest representations in Indian art of the woman and tree motif. Next slide, please. And uh, coming to the Buddhist art, uh, Buddhist architecture, you have these two pillars which have come to light. One where the pillar is actually uh, represented by a woman holding a basket of food and a bottle of water and above her a head is a, like a vessel like structure or a trough like structure and uh, the image on the right has a woman uh, entwining one of her legs uh, with the stalk of a uh, or, or, a, uh, or a tree um, uh, and her, uh, she, she's being elevated by a male figure seated below her. And she's supposed to be performing some kind of a ritual or some kind of a, um, a ritual that, that can be interpreted as uh, the Ashoka Doha, the Krida, or the Krida of kicking of the tree. And this is referred in many uh, literary texts about how um, Ashoka Doha is a kind of a, a festival that is celebrated where um, women go into the garden and kick the trees for it to bloom. So there is a transfer of uh, fertility or the celebration of uh, the fertility or the fertile aspect of the tree and the woman being celebrated through this uh, representation. Uh, this is one kind of uh, interpretation that I feel uh, is what is being um, depicted in this sculpture. Next slide, please. Now, these are the, uh, the sources uh, that I'm showing you before I show you the sculptures of the Devangana. So I'm trying to actually um, take you through, lead you through the, the, the substratum or uh, the kind of uh, basis on which the iconography of the Devanganas evolves as we go along. Uh, in the post Gupta period where temple architecture becomes much more complex and details of uh, motifs uh, are introduced in the sculptural language of the Nagara temple architecture. Here I have compiled some sources from the Puranas uh, referring to the Apsaras. <clears throat> Sorry for the mistake in the spelling. Uh, so the Apsaras are, uh, again, ref uh, they, their references go all the way back to the Vedic and Puranic literature. They are supposed to be born from the churning of the ocean. Uh, they, are, they are also supposed to be born from the mind of Brahma, Manasa, Kanyas. They are born from wind. They are born from water. They are also known as daughters of Rishi Kashyapa and his wife Arishta. And when they emerge, they adorn, uh, they are given to Indra to in, adorn the Indra Sabha. Uh, in Natya Shastra, they are supposed to emerge from the uh, Samudra Manthan and given to um, Bharata Muni uh, when he's planning uh, the uh, dance drama on Samudra Manthan. So they are actually supposed to be actors or uh, dancers. Uh, there's also references to Shiniwali, Puramdha, Purandhi, and Ila all the way early uh, in the li Vedic literature. And in some of the Puranas like Matsya Puran, um, uh, Bhagavat Puran, uh, Vayu Puran, you have references to individual stories of the various Apsaras, such as Urvashi, Menaka, Rambha, and so on. So, and also Gritachi. So I, I want to highlight that the iconography of some of these Devanganas are actually also rooted in the literature of the Vedic and the Puranic period. 
and the apsaras are actually uh, the basis also for the visualization of the saras as well as uh, iconographically you also find in the next few slides i will be showing you uh, the many of the uh, yakshis the iconography of the many of the yakshis continues as apsaras and um, just to also highlight to you the word apsara surasundari madanika uh, devangana i use them interchangeably and the reason for using the term devangana uh, for the material that i have uh, been studying is also because there is a text that was found in gujarat called sri raranam based on which uh, the reference of, uh, of devangana as a term uh, for defining the surasundari or madanika or apsara has been um, brought to light and because i started my research from gujarat i have stuck to the term devangana uh, so just to answer the question of some of you who are wondering why i'm using the word apsara and devangana interchangeably here is a very excellent example of surya temple and as i said um, also sun temples are associated with apsaras because there is a very interesting uh, uh, verse in a um, group of verses in vishnu puran which describe uh, the arrival of sun uh, every month in his car you have several um, you know uh, people who accompany him and among them you also have uh, the uh, uh, you have the Usha Pratyusha, you have Rishis, you have Yakshas, Yakshis, you also have Apsaras. And what I have found in my study, in all the Surya temples, there will always be next to the Bhadra Deva Koshta, which will be of the sun god, there will always be two Apsaras flanking him. And which is what you see here from the example uh, we have taken from the Tus temple in Rajasthan of the 11th century. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I come to the description uh, or the understanding which I just explained about the similarities between yaksha, Yakshis and Apsaras. So in visual representation, uh, we are going through uh, the iconography of Yakshis continuing into the medieval period. And their placement varies as iconography evolved, but their presence never disappeared. And as I said, they are Avarana Devatas, but they are not just decorative appendages in my understanding after studying so many monuments uh, across 400 years, uh, that they are not just simple Avarana Devatas, but they lend auspiciousness to the temple uh, monument, to the religious monument. And they also, because of their sensuous um, representation and the representation of the feminine body in very uh, overtly sensuous form, it is also one of the ways by which, um, you know, philosophically interpreting uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the devotee is uh, encouraged to rise above the sens the world of sensuality as they enter the temple and go approach towards the uh, sanctum sanctorum. Um, <clears throat> so this is one uh, one interpretation of the, the reason why uh, most of the apsaras are in, uh, apsaras or devangnas are shown in very uh, erotic or sensuous forms. And I also mentioned earlier that these iconographies are common and they are shared by the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain architectures, which means that understanding and knowledge about them would have transmitted from region to region through the architectural guilds. Next point. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I take you to the next stage of my presentation, the various iconographies um, or the, the terms or different types of uh, Devanganas that I have identified. And I start with Swastana Sparsha. Uh, this, this uh, 
I have taken help of uh, my Sanskrit uh, lecturer colleague in the university because some of these terms are not uh, known from architectural texts. Uh, there are many representations from the Yakshis onwards, that is from the Buddhist architecture of the second, third century onwards, that you see the presence of uh, the, the Yakshi standing right above a brimming pot and uh, clutching her breast. So this uh, symbolizes abundance in nature and um, nourishing, nourishing aspect of the nature and the feminine. And you can see the back of the uh, uh, pillar is also very well carved. And in detail, you can see the presence of vegetation and blooming nature. Next slide, please. And this is an example of Swasana Swarsha of the 10th century from Gurgi in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, this is a fragment of a temple that has been uh, obviously dismantled. Uh, but right in the middle of two vyalas, you see uh, the Devangana clutching her uh, breast and in a beautiful, striking a beautiful Tribanga in a very dynamic animated pose. Next slide, please. Another example of Swastana Sparsha from Jagat Ambika Mata temple, you can see two of them. Uh, right uh, in the middle is a Bhadra Deva Koshta. You have another Devangana and you have the <coughs> Vyala. So uh, <clears throat> you can see the different poses, different stance. They have, uh, uh, they, have uh, they are striking, but the iconography is quite consistently the same. Next slide, please. And the uh, Shala Banjika, the woman and tree motif, you have the best examples in front of you from Sanchi and from Sanghol, uh, sorry, from Sonk. Uh, this also represents the uh, fertility or fructifying nature of uh, interchangeably between nature and uh, female. Next slide, please. You have... Uh, Ayagapatta from a giant stupa also showing the uh, the, the <clears throat> entrance uh, doorway with the uh, two uh, shalabandikas on the side. Next slide, please. Uh, here I have now examples from uh, uh, from uh, two river goddesses. Now I introduce one more iconographic type: the Nadi Devatas, Ganga and Yamuna. And we find their presence also at uh, at Ajanta, at Elora, and also at these two uh, uh, Gupta temples at Tigova. Um, uh, so where you see um, uh, that um, Ganga is holding a mirror in her hand on the left, and Yamuna is uh, holding the uh, or striking the pose of the Shalabanjika. Next slide, please. So yet another iconography of the lady holding the mirror, Darpana, is introduced. And uh, I'm sure all of you are aware uh, there is a lot of representation of lady hold, holding a mirror in many temples across different parts of India. Now I introduce one more iconography called the Putra Vallabha, mother and child, uh, both from the pillars of a Buddhist, uh, uh, a Buddhist uh, monument at Sanghol, and at uh, Jhalra Patan, you see both of them represented on pillar. So the presence of mother and child on a, on a religious architectural pillar and from the ceiling, which is in the center. Uh, this is an example from um, Sun Temple at Tus. Uh, so again, uh, at different locations in the building, you see the presence of mother and child. Uh, this also implies the significance played uh, placed on the role of uh, the woman as mother and also the iconography uh, by its presence on the pillar, which is a very supporting structure, also implies the role played by a mother in a, um, just like a mother plays in a family as this uh, architectural iconography plays in the temple architecture. Next slide, please. Uh, a few more examples of the mother and child. This is from Jagat Ambika Mata temple, uh, where you see the, the woman is striking a very uh, dynamic pose and 
also balancing the child on her uh, on her hand uh, placed right right next to the uh, Bhadra Deva poster. And you can also see, admire the postures of the other uh, Devanganas as well, and a very strong presence of the Yali, of the Vyala figures. Um, the architectural, uh, I also want you to uh, to note that in the Maru Gurjara uh, temple architecture, you also see very important role being given to um, uh, uh, figurative sculpture. And the detailing of the figurative sculptures is quite elaborate. They're almost realistic. They're almost like jutting out, coming alive. Next slide, please. Yeah, now we come to uh, yet another iconography that I would like to introduce. Uh, it's called the Keshan Istoya Karini. Uh, this is also a term we have coined for the, the this type of um, Devanganas. And the first one is from uh, Sanghol. The second one is from um, Khajraho. And the third one is from Rani Bao, uh, in Gujarat, Patan. Uh, again, you can admire the representation of how the bodies animate. Uh, the most interesting are, uh, is the flexion in the body of the Khajraho sculpture, uh, which is seen from the back, almost twisted. Uh, and you also see the, the one uh, from Rani Vau is also touching her breast. And above her, you can see the representation of mangoes. So there is also a sort of uh, combination of uh, Keshan Istoy Karini, the woman um, uh, removing hair, uh, water from her hair, and the uh, uh, swan uh, near her feet is taking the droplets of that water. So it's a very sensuous, uh, Shringaric uh, sort of representation that is being uh, reflected in this um, iconography. Next slide, please. Uh, yet another uh, examples, again, very beautiful, one from the Asian Civilizations Museum's collection, uh, perhaps from the Khajraho area. And the second one is from Jagat Ambika Mata Temple in Rajasthan. Next slide, please. Uh, Kanduka Krida, the woman playing with a ball. So with the Shala Bhanjika uh, of Raj Shekhar has a very interesting uh, description about this where the heroine of the play uh, called Murugankavati is supposed to be playing uh, this particular, uh, I mean, engaged in this particular play. Uh, and there's a, a interesting uh, episode in the, in the uh, with the Shala Banjika. And also in um, Dandins, Dashakumara Charita, uh, where some of the uh, women characters go to the Vindhyavasini Mata's temple and perform the Kanduka Kirida as part of the ritual uh, offering. So th this uh, literary reference is very interesting in elaborating and giving us a context of the social and religious practice that would have gone along with uh, the play of ball uh, and how that would have been the inspiration for the sculptors to visualize this iconography. Um, next slide, please more examples uh, and here i bring to your attention the earliest representation of kanduk krida in 8th century at roda uh, the example on the uh, right and the example on the left is from jagat ambika mata temple it's a, almost a representation of a, a play or a dance performance uh, from the, the way the posture is being struck and what is very interesting the roda example also has a dwarf figure uh, so like a Vidushak character who is interacting with the Naika or the, you know, the lady. So it could also very much have been in influenced or inspired by a play that the artist would have seen, um, Dandin's play or Raj Shikhar's play being enacted somewhere. This is, this is my interpretation. <clears throat> Next slide, please.
yet another example of Kandukrida from the two Surya temple. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And now we come to the iconography of Alasa or the woman striking the, the pose of stretching her uh, hands above her head and uh, stand the, the, the one from the uh, uh, Rani Kivao is also uh, putting her leg in front as if she's moving forward. So this pose is called Baddhachari. So while, as you know, I was a dance student when I did this research, I have identified and um, uh, labeled every pose of the hands and feet of these Devanganas. So one of these happens to be interesting and that example is right in front of us. So this is the Baddhachari pose struck by the Alasa or a Devangana striking the uh, Alasa pose. And the example from, uh, <clears throat> from a private collection is also very, very beautiful where you can see the uh, the devangana has stretched her head up, uh, right almost at uh, you know um, right angle to her feet so that also shows the way the artist has actually been able to visualize the movement in the body of the devangana so for sure they would have seen dance um, or uh, some kind of performances by visualizing these sculptures next slide please Another example of uh, Alasa from uh, Gurgi, uh, 10th century. Next slide. <clears throat> now I come to the more uh, explicit imagery uh, of the Devanganas. Uh, this is the Vasana Bransha, where you can see uh, an example from uh, Bhuteshwar, uh, Mathura. Uh, from the Mathura Museum, where you can see the woman is uh, disrobing herself or her own uh, lower garment. While in the Rani Kivao example, you see a, 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 a um, carving of a scorpion, which is stuck in the inner side of her garment. And she's trying to remove the garment and dusting it off. So this kind of very explicit sexual um, representation is also found in um, both Buddhist and uh, Hindu temple architecture. And this iconography consistently makes its way uh, from Gujarat also into, um, into uh, Khajuraho or from Khajuraho to Gujarat. It's very difficult to identify the movement, but you can find this iconography in many places. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, uh, from Gadarmal temple, again, a uh, very early example, 8th century. And uh, the one on the right is obviously from the Madhya Pradesh region only of a slightly later, maybe 10th century, where you can see the monkey. Uh, so it is um, Markata Cheshta, where the woman is uh, being um, uh, disturbed by a monkey. And she is also trying to hold on to her garment and also trying to strike the monkey. So again, a very animated and very dynamic pose. Next slide, please. Another example of Markata Cheshta from um, uh, from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, one is the first one, um, Reva Maharaja's palace. Sorry, no, this one is Khajuraho, and the other one is from Gurgi. The Khajurao example is actually in the National Museum. I'm sure many of you have seen it. But if you have not, the next time you go to the National Museum, you please remember to uh, identify this sculpture. And um, also, uh, it would be very important to, uh, it would be important if I don't mention that the sculpture, the realism of the Khajurao sculpture is really very striking. And it is one of the best examples of uh, sculpture carved from the back. We normally see examples of uh, figures always from front, but this is a very unique example where you see a realistic carving of a uh, human body from the back. Next slide, please. Um, more examples of Markat Cheshta. This is again from uh, Ambika Mata Temple Jagat on the left. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, now I have uh, brought in uh, yet another sort of dimension to the iconography of the Devanganas. This is a more uh, aggressive as well as uh, uh, that is dynamic, uh, um, um, brave as well as ascetic. So you have um, women holding weapons uh, right from the time of the uh, uh, Buddhist monuments, like the Amazonian women, they may be Pratiharis, they may be warriors. Uh, and you have in the representation at Rani Kiva, these two beautiful examples where one is standing and the other is striking a dance like pose. Uh, both of them are holding uh, a skull club. So they could also be uh, either yoginis or they could be um, some form of uh, uh, um, some form of uh, ritual practitioners who also uh, performed uh, some kind of uh, dances which were quite um, militant in nature. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of the Khardadharini uh, from Sachiyamata Temple in Ocean, next to the st statue or uh, uh, carving of a uh, Vishnu in uh, Vishnu uh, in the Tri Vikrama pose. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to uh, now take you through a very complex diagram, which is actually the sum total of my research, uh, which I could have started at the beginning, but I thought I'd bring it to the end. So uh, how I see or how I define the iconography of Apsaras, Devanganas um, is uh, at the core. So I use a color circle because I was trained in a, a fine arts faculty. I'm an art student. I'm very familiar with the, uh, with the color circle. So I use that as my basis. Uh, to plot the different iconographies, some of which I have taken you through just in the last few minutes. So at the core, I have studied also dance, and I have also studied um, dance um, dance texts. I have studied architectural texts for the research of for this thesis. Uh, I have also looked at the Devadasi cult or the Devadasi practice, which was associated with many of these temples um, way back uh, in the 9th, 10th century. We have many references, uh, even during the Solanki period, um, Chaula Devi being one of the very uh, prominent uh, stories that have come down uh, through history. So um, at the core of the um, imagery or iconography of the Devanganas and Apsaras or Sura Sundaris is the ever auspicious character, the Nitya Sumangali. And while uh, moving from that core, we move to the four directions or the eight directions, where uh, the, the prominent being the, uh, the idea of fertility, of um, abundance, uh, of wish fulfillment, of um, you know, continuous uh, uh, growth and uh, renewal, regeneration of humanity, of nature, of society. And so we will come to the Ashoka Dohada iconography or the Putra Vallabha, which I just showed you. And I plot along as we go from the right to left. Um, we have the fertility and sensuality aspects, which then uh, turn towards uh, sexuality, and from there, they talk, move towards decorative and they move towards uh, performative as Nati Nartaki. Uh, and then move from there towards more ferocious, more aggressive, more fierce. Um, and then from there, they move towards asceticism, bravery, and austerity. So as you can see in the outer circle, I have identified and placed some of the iconographies of the Devanganas. Sharla Banjika, Sri Lakshmi, Swastana Sparsha in the fertility concept. Sensuality is the Sadhyasnata, taking bath or Keshani um, Stoya Karini, wringing the hair, the water from the hair. Markate Cheshta, uh, Rati uh, in the sensuality aspect. Then for, for eroticism, you have the Alasa, Kharjura Vahaka, Vasana Bransha, 
paribhog darshini i did not show that example but there are also examples a number of them from hajraho uh, identifying that so there's a very strong aspect of sexuality being identified through these um, imageries then you have the decorative where she's putting on makeup like the prasadika darpana viewing herself in the mirror nupur padika uh, as well as uh, coming towards the performative the nati nartaki uh, where you also have uh, more fierce ones holding uh, uh, weapons in their hands like marichi khadgadharini sarpadharini we also have uh, devangnas holding um, uh, serpent uh, they could also be uh, snake charmers uh, there are also names which are defined in the iconography in in the iconographical texts which i have actually not uh, referred here but there are mention of uh, certain um, devanganas like menaka urvashi rambha gauri and so on there are about 32 of them and then moving towards the more um, uh, bravery aspect is the kirati the bhairavi kapaldhari and then moving uh, in the end towards the ascetic aspect uh, yogini and tapasi uh, which i explain uh, which i illustrated uh, so this is the full circle or full uh, depth or the breadth of the iconography where on one side you have the shringara on the opposite side you have the veera and between the two you have the various other iconographies that can be explained or understood uh, i see a lot of questions so i'm actually going to end here um, my presentation and if there's time uh, permitted uh, i'll be happy to answer your questions thank you so much is there any more slides i think this is the last slide yeah there are no other slides yeah okay so i'll stop sharing yeah i think we could take some questions if you are uh, you are okay with that yes i'm 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 fine yeah so uh, Sujata Gamango, I think you have already. Some of the questions you? which I spotted, I have also tried to answer. Right. Shiva mm -hmm. Sundari and Kanaka Sundari of Konak Temple. Purbali has raised her hand. What is the earliest depiction of specific river goddess Ganga, Yamuna, or any other? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What is the earliest depiction of a specific river goddess, Ganga, Yamuna, or any other? Yeah, so Ganga, Yamuna are both represented in Gupta tem temples already. Gupta period already has representation of Ganga and Yamuna on temple uh, doorways. And they are also found in Vakataka architecture at Ajanta. So they are found on the doorways at the top. And as I explained in through my visuals, they are also shown uh, in the Shalabanjika pose. So my understanding is that it evolves out of the Shalabanjika iconography into uh, the, um, uh, the uh, into the uh, river goddess uh, um, iconography, where they are. Of course, they are shown uh, on the crocodile and. Uh, uh, tortoise that iconography is already there but there is also the presence of uh, uh, the uh, river goddesses at the top of the deva koshta uh, the top of the dwarashaka of the temple entrance and then by the uh, late gupta and pratihara period they move towards the down that is towards the udumbara near the threshold and that is where you find always ganga and yamuna in uh, Gupta as well as uh, post Gupta uh, 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 Pratihara temples. Presence of Saraswati we only find later, and that is uh, in the uh, Elora temple. I see Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, all three in the Kailashna temple, but we don't find Saraswati very much in the um, what we call the Nagara temple or the Maru Gurjara temples that I am discussing right now. There is only uh, Ganga and Yamuna, and they find their uh, permanent location at the Deva, at the Dwarashaka of the Garbagriha.
for the purification. So the interpretation generally given is uh, they help to uh, cl clarify, you know, uh, you have you're cleaned yourself mentally after going around the temple and looking at all these sculptures. And when you have entered through the Mukhamandapa and going towards the Garbhagriha, you are cleansing your mind. And finally, the Ganga Yamuna at the uh, Dwara Shaka at the base helps to clarify or uh, helps to purify um, the mind and body both as you enter towards the Garbhagriha or uh, present yourself in front of the deity. That is my understanding. Thank you. Are Devangana iconographic figures or stylized structures? I think that you have already answered. No, it's an Very iconography. Nice. I spent the last yeah. whole hour yeah. explaining that. Right. So uh, please repeat the name of the book defining Devangana. I think you were referring to Kshina, uh, Kshiraranava, right? Kshiraranava, yeah. Okay. Is there any correlation between that as well? Uh, Karnaka Sundari and Sura Sundari. I, I think this was. Is there any correlation between Sura Sundari and Kanaka Sundari of Konark temple? Uh, these, these are just definite, uh, I mean, these are just terms which have evolved over time. I have not heard Kanaka Sundari, I only know Sura Sundari, and that comes from Shilpa Prakash. Uh, do we find any specific iconographic representation of Sinivani? No. I'm I'm using them as uh, literary references. There's no iconography. A as a reference to the evolution of Lakshmi, in the context of Lakshmi. How these beautiful figures were modeled. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. No, they would have seen, of course, the women dancers, around them, yeah. but dancers, devadasis, performers, they would have seen and observed. So, actually, I want to highlight in through this question that uh, no iconography of the goddess is one thing. You know, there is prescriptive approach. Even there, you see, our artists have taken so much of. Uh, uh, a beautiful uh, you know visualization for the depiction of say durga or uh, lakshmi or saraswati but this body of uh, sculpture which i call the non mainstream you know it's not a mother goddess or a, you know a deity it's uh, they are um, i would say part of the iconography but they are not so strict uh, in fo following the iconography so they follow certain diagrammatic formats or yantras for the formation, like this deity should be in Samabhanga, or this deity should be in Dvibhanga, or this deity should be in Tribhanga. But when it comes to the reference of making the Devangana sculptures, the artists have taken even more liberty. And that is why we see so many variety in the different regions. That is what I was trying to express. Right. Is there any effect of Buddhist iconography on later period in uh, Gurjar Pratihara style? No, actually, what I'm trying to say is that there is no direct influence. What I'm saying is that through guilds of sculptors, certain knowledge system or certain yantras or, sh or diagrammatic formats would have been transmitted from one generation to the other because gurjar pratihar and buddhist there is a wide difference of about uh, you know 400 years 400 to 600 years so it is not possible that there is a direct influence but what i am trying to say is that certain knowledge has been transmitted across generations of craftsmen or stapati guilds in uh, you know up uh, uttar pradesh madhya pradesh gujarat rajasthan and other areas also so uh, what i am trying to say is that there is a correlation but there's no direct uh, uh, there's no direct um, influence because there is a big, big gap in uh, you know time difference almost 400 years but what I'm trying to show is that there is a knowledge which has transmitted across generations somehow. Because you can see in the iconography. 
purbali you had raised your hand do you still have a question do you want to ask something anita korde ma'am also has raised uh, please uh, purbali if you have a question unmute yourself and ask uh hello ma'am i'm a big fan uh whatever i little i know about apsaras has mainly i've learned from you what i want to ask you is that the way we have dhyana shlokas for various deities are there any dhyana shlokas for uh, apsaras as well no <clears throat> there are no dhyana that is what again i was trying to say they are not mainstream deities so there is <clears throat> there are no dhyana shlokas there is no iconographical texts also until shiraram so um, in uh, aparajit prach uh they there are texts like that um, they mention only uh in this particular uh, location like on the ceiling or on the pillar or on the devakoshta place the devangana sculptures or the apsara sculptures or the surasundari sculpture they do not give details about their iconography they only define what should be placed where but when you come to shri rarnava there is a detailed uh, reference this uh, th there are 32 types of devangnas and in each of them uh, th their name is given and how they should be uh, shown and also how many times they can repeat it on a janga um how many times they can be repeated on a janga is not necessarily given but uh, there are normally 32 of them 32 okay. or 36 of them a uh, good example of that is kaya varohan temple in gujarat where the sompuras who have edited kshiraranava have also followed the text in the carving of the sculpture so if you ever have a chance to go please uh, visit that temple thank you so much ma'am alkeji you could unmute yourself and ask your question uh, just be brief no, because she was, she was saying something about shri lakshmi and i had missed that point so i just wanted to know what what exactly was that point yeah i referred to shri lakshmi from shri sukta in the context of the um, aditi uttana pada where you see the fem feminine body with a lotus head holding two lotuses so this has been kind of uh, iconographical uh, correlation with the shri sukta text of this early representation of the aditi sculptures thank you ma'am and second question it's not a question it's just a, my curiosity that when they put in more more of the gajalakshmi in different temples so is there anything like a relation but we don't find that in more in north so or it was in north existing and it would have gone be, with this all wars and other some things coming out the representation of gajalakshmi actually comes in uh, buddhist architecture also uh, but in temple architecture gajalakshmi always finds its place in the lalata bimba of the temple's uh, door frame of the garbhagriha door frame so that we find everywhere but it is much later we don't find that in the early stages but early stage we we do have a woman standing on a lotus with two elephants uh, you know with uh, pots pouring water over her which is actually also seen earliest representation is seen in uh, buddhist art in at baro you know, i am what i am asking is like uh, in northern temples very less is seen whereas uh, south india they they show many times in many places so that is only thing that no gajalakshmi may have it been in existed in north india also north india as i said it is in the lalata bimba of the garbhagriha's oh. uh, door frame it is there gajalakshmi okay. is always there uh, thank go you go ahead ji uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question and after that we will take only uh, ms sayani devnas question because otherwise we'll run out of time I'm sure this topic is such that you know. Hello, am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Please yeah. go ahead. जी uh, thank you so much, uh, ma'am. मैं speaker को बहुत ही धन्यवाद कहना चाहूँगा कि आपने uh, am I speak in Hindi, ma'am? जी जी. 
बोलिए बोलिए धन्यवाद कहना चाहूंगा मैम जी कि आपने बहुत अच्छे से एक्सप्लेन किया है टू लिटिल क्वेश्चन पहला ये है कि मैम जैसे आपने बताया गंगा और जमुना के जो कल्चर डोर जम्बू में मेरे स्थान में मुनि बाबा टेम्पल करके टेम्पल है तो वहां पे मैंने देखे है तो आपने जैसे बताया कि सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ गंगा एंड यमुना कल्चर आर दैट कि आप जब मंदिर में दाखिल हो तो अपने प्योर सोल के साथ जाए तो एनी सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ कैन यू टेल मेट इज एनी सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ अक्षरा और देवांगना इन टेम्पल Yeah, that is just like for Shringar purpose. Yeah, that is what I said. That the temple inside. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 आगे जो स्पिरिचुअल स्तर है वहां पे ले जाने की कोशिश करता है तो जब इंसान मंदिर का ये करता है प्रदक्षिणा करता है तो वो धीरे धीरे ये सारे फिगर्स को देखते देखते मंदिर के मुख मंडप पे पहुंचता है और उसके बाद वो अंदर जाता है और जब गर्भगृह के सामने जाता है तो वहां पर द प्रोसेस ऑफ प्योरिफिकेशन एंड्स so uh, apsara therefore also represents a kind of a uh, earthly world the world of the common people and from there it is slowly evolving uh, beyond that to uh, the spiritual level but in themselves they are not for decorative purpose they are meant to lend auspiciousness to the temple through their iconography ओके ओके दैट्स ग्रेट अंडरस्टैंड प्रॉपर्ली मतलब आप ऐसे कहना चाह रहे हैं कि जैसे uh, आप सारी चीजों से बाहर निकलकर ये सभी uh, चीजों से बाहर निकलकर आप मुख्य देवता को भी ध्यान uh, में ले यस राइट मैम एंड मैम सेकंड लास्ट थिंग इज के जैन आइकोनोग्राफी में भी ये सेम अफसरा ही रहते हैं या उनके नाम और थोड़ा अलग रहता है जैसे तारंगा जैन टेम्पल हो गया तो वहां पे भी मैंने अफसरा मतलब देवांगनाओं को देखा है तो वहाँ पे भी सेम नाम रहते हैं या जैन आइकोनोग्राफी में या अलग रहते हैं तो वही जैन आइकोनोग्राफी में काफी सारी अप्सराए और देवांगनाएं जो हिंदू आर्किटेक्चर में है वो उससे मिलती जुलती हैं मगर सभी नहीं तो उनका मतलब वहाँ पे डिफरेंस भी है थोड़ा सा ऐसा हम यस यस तो मैम उसके लिए हमें कौन सी मतलब जो एक बुक है जैन आइकोनोग्राफी प्रिय बाला प्रिय बाला शाह तो वो बुक इज इनफ फॉर अंडरस्टैंडिंग दी अफसराज इन जैन आइकोनोग्राफी पर यू शुड सी अदर बुक्स ऑन जैन आइकोनोग्राफी दैट हैव बीन रिटन आफ्टर प्रिय बाला शाह आई कैन थिंक ऑफ एनी थैंक यू Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering my question. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, madam, uh, for this uh, lecture. This is very informative and beautiful, also. So I wanted to say one thing that um, these. Uh, these images of devangana they are actually the life of a temple as i feel they are the life in various types uh, and the images and another point is that you told that there is no dhano sloko of these apsharas or i think there is no iconographical special uh, features also yeah so they they were actually actually uh, the the uh, the artist uh, created these temples out of uh, liberal uh, out of his, uh, his uh, liberty of thought these are yes. space, space so uh, is there uh, anything like uh, i mean uh, uh, gender uh, actually they they are not so important uh, in the um, theoretical texts but they are uh, important in a temple when we go to see uh, visit some temple we see them 
and we interpret them and so on so is the they, they belong to the ordinary uh, ordinary women i think so they are not dts so is there any uh, gender uh, sense in in a way they are not given importance theoretically is there any such uh, thought yeah why they are they are isolated uh, from the texts i mean from iconography or uh, dhanu sloko uh, very good question thank you uh, madam yeah very good question um so both as i said samrangan sutradhar and aparajita prachcha do not mention uh, their uh, details but they they are prescripted or they are prescribed that in this location make this uh, imagery uh, which are very much uh, 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 driven and carried on through the centuries in many many texts until we come to uh, later texts or even in shilpa prakash uh, and um, many other uh, temples uh, temple related architectural texts they are mentioned but they do not go into the details of their iconography until kshirarna vriksharna and uh, diparna the three texts of which kshirarna is one of the older texts 15th century so uh, we can say that um, your point about uh, you know gender uh, yes they are not ordinary women they are semi uh, semi divine uh, they are auspicious uh, they lend a lot of uh, strength and power to the monument because they are like the avarana devata so they fortify the structure of the temple so as you can see the devakoshtas the bhadra devakoshtas have all the deity forms like if it's a devi temple then you have the bhadra devakoshtas all the devis but along the side of the three walls uh, that is you know if it is east facing then you have the the east the west and the north you always have Uh, the representation of the uh, apsaras so in my view they are actually fortifying the temple they are le leaving i mean lending energy or auspiciousness to the structure and protect giving protection to the deity inside but for the iconography or visualization because it was left for the artist to imagine they created they their own, own interpretation, interpretation. so that is where uh, i uh, i see it as um, um, a re relaxation of uh, the prescribed norm but yet in the architectural uh, sthapati tradition across uh, the regions of india there was a certain um, oral tradition by which uh, uh, one generation would uh, teach the next generation how to make these uh, apsara sculptures so that is how i see it but from the uh, feminist perspective if i if i were to answer this question it also means that you know without uh, the presence of the woman uh, without the strength or power of the woman the male is uh, you know incomplete uh, or the the yes, uh, the, yes. the ishta yes. is incomplete yes. so you definitely need both the you know the the feminine and the masculine combined to make anything uh, effective or make the yeah. uh, the efficacy of the temple come alive and perpetuate through generations yes that's what my understanding is thank you so much have a nice time thank you uh, you are on mute i'm sorry uh thank you so much uh before we conclude just to answer the to the questions about recording of the people i mean we will soon be putting this entire thing on youtube and we will circulate the link to all of you so that you can once again go through the entire thing and i'm sure a lecture of this kind needs to be uh you know gone over and over again to really understand the essence of it thank you so much ma'am for such an enthralling discourse i i mean and uh, a very 
going into details of fundamentals of everything, yet keeping it very simple and lucid. I think, yeah, the, I mean, what what can one ask for more than this? Thank you so much. Thank you My so pleasure. much. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. And thank you, Chetana ji and your team for inviting me. And it was such an honor uh, to remember the work of Dhaki Saab and to share my two cents worth of what I have learned from him. My pleasure is all ours, ma'am. And I'm sure everybody would want to go through your book also. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. Please, please uh, share the details about the book in the chat group. Uh, in I the will. chat box as well. I will. Uh, so thank you all of you. I mean, thanks to the audience. Thank you to ma'am, of course, the, the uh, and the entire audience. Thanks to uh, Joge sir and Ranveer sir, without whom, you know, who have always been our uh, support system in everything that we do at Sambhasha. So thanks to uh, them. And thank you, Sanyukta, for such a wonderful introduction. And thanks the entire team of Sambhasha because this can always be only a teamwork and nothing can be done uh, by one person alone. So with that, uh, I think I declare the, the session as being complete. Ma'am, I'll just put this in the chat box. This was the power of female, same name, right? Yes, the same title. Uh, the, yeah. the lecture's title is the title of the book. Yeah, right. The power of the female. And it was by DK Print World. Right. Devangana sculptures. Uh, I'm making a lot of spelling mistakes here. I think it will be available on Amazon. Yes, it is. So people could, yeah. I've put it in the chat box. You could go through, uh, I mean, I'm sure you would want to read the book. And uh, thank you all once again. Look forward to having all of you again for all our sessions, all our activities that we do. Please support us by your attendance every time. Thank you so much. And uh, I think I declare this as concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the recording.